Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering pyloric stenosis and interception. Both of these are medical disorders that you find in pediatrics. So before we get started, guys, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to please support me, support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it, so press that like button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. All right, let's start with pyloric stenosis. Take a look at what it says. It says um, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. This occurs when the circumferential muscle of the pyloric sphincter becomes thick, resulting in elongation and narrowing of the pyloric canal. So I want you guys to take a look. Look at Remember the sphincter up here, that's your cardiac sphincter. It's closer to your heart. That's how you remember that's a cardiac sphincter. And the sphincter, the lower one, this is the pyloric sphincter. So what's happening, guys, look at how thick it becomes and elongated. And so um, the contents, the gastric contents cannot flow freely from the um, stomach to the small intestine, Okay. The lumen's supposed to be nice and wide like this, except it's thick and it's narrow. Let's keep going. This condition usually develops in the first few weeks of life, causing non bilis vomiting, which occurs after feeding. Projectile vomiting may develop and the infant's fussy and hungry after vomiting. So let's talk about that because... Um, it's important for you guys to know the vomiting that the patient experiences, there shouldn't be any bile. Again, guys, look at where the problem is. The problem's down here. All of the gastric contents are still up here. So what happens is the gastric contents, they're supposed to be flowing through the stomach to the small intestine, can't get through. So of course the patient's going to be vomiting because what happens? It backs up and 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 they vomit. There's no bile in there. The contents are still where? In the stomach. And why is it projectile vomiting? When I say projectile vomiting, I'm talking about that vomit can fly three feet in the air. It's projectile vomiting. Why? All of the pressure of the gastric uh, contents backing up because it cannot get through this very narrow lumen, the sphincter, okay? If the condition is not diagnosed early, dehydration, metabolic alkalosis, and failure to thrive can occur dehydration i did a video on that already you know what dehydration is there's not enough fluid that's in the vascular space they're losing their fluid they're throwing up all their fluid right it's not moving metabolic alkalosis think about it what is in the stomach besides the food that the person's eating or the food that the child is eating what is it hydrochloric acid so when the patient's losing all the acid it throws them into a what alkalinic state it makes sense that they're going to have metabolic alkalosis because they're getting rid of all their acid and of course failure to thrive because all of the vitamins all of the minerals all of the nutrients that are in food that is supposed to be absorbed the patient's throwing it all up so you guys do need to know um the pathophysiology of what's um of what's happening the circular muscle of the pylorus thickens as a result of hypertrophy and i just showed you the image of what's going on over time inflammation and edema further reduces the side of the open the size of the opening so that lumen gets even uh, smaller because of the inflammation and edema resulting in complete obstruction everything that goes in has to come out one way or another the hypertrophy pylorus may become palpable as an olive-like mass in the upper abdomen. Guys, the minute you see olive-like mass, you need to be thinking of pyloric stenosis. Signs and symptoms. Vomiting usually occurs 30, 60 minutes after the feeding and becomes projectile as the obstruction progresses. Because as the child feeds and it goes in the stomach, it's supposed to go to the small intestine, but it can't because there's a blockage. It's going to have to come out somehow, right? Let's look at these clinical manifestations. Projectile vomiting may be ejected three to four feet from the child when in sideline position. Infant's going to be hungry. They're vomiting every little uh, uh, piece of food that goes in their uh, belly. No evidence of pain or discomfort. Poor weight gain because they're not absorbing any of the nutrients. Signs of, de signs of dehydration because they're not holding on to all their fluid. They're vomiting the fluid. Distended upper abdomen. Of course, that upper abdomen is distended. That fluid, that food, those nutrients are not moving. 
It's not going into the small intestine the way it should. Look at this readily palpable olive shaped tumor. Once you see that olive shape, again, guys, make sure you're thinking of pyloric stenosis, visible gastric peristaltic waves that move from left to right. All right, diagnostic evaluation. Oh, before we get to then, before we get to that, let me scroll up a little bit for you. There we go. Diagnostic evaluation. Again, I think this is the third time that you guys are seeing olive like mass. What did I tell you when the author keeps repeating themselves? That means most likely you're going to see that on a test somewhere, right? So make sure you know the olive-like mass that goes with pyloric stenosis. Olive-like mass is most easily palpated when the stomach's empty, the infant's quiet, and the abdominal muscles are relaxed. They'll do an ultrasound. They can do an upper GI x-ray. Laboratory findings are going to show metabolic alterations, most likely what? Metabolic alkalosis, because the patient's losing all the um, hydrochloric acid in their stomach. The BUN is going to be elevated because of dehydration. When the patient's dehydrated, guys, you're going to see that kidney function affected. BUN is going to be increased. Creatinine is going to be increased. Urine output may be decreased, right? What's your H and H going to be? Your hematocrit and hemoglobin, you expect it to be increased. Those are uh, uh, um, laboratory findings that you'll find in dehydration. If you guys are not... Um, well, versus in dehydration, make sure you go back and watch the video I did on dehydration because for pediatrics, you absolutely have to know um, dehydration. All right, therapeutic management. Surgical relief of the pyloric obstruction by, am I going to try to pronounce this word? Of course I am, and I'm going to butcher it. Pyloromyotomy. I did it. Pyloromyotomy is a standard therapy for this disorder. Now I'm going to show you guys something. That's, that's surgery. This is what they do. Remember? At first, the pyloric sphincter, look how, look at that thick olive-shaped mass, right? And look how uh, um, narrow that lumen is, right? But look at after surgery, look at how it opened up. So now all of the gastric, um, the contents of the, the stomach can flow from the stomach to the small intestine. You see the difference between these two? Okay. So moving on. Uh, preoperatively, the infant must be rehydrated because remember, they're vomiting a lot. They're going through dehydration because they're losing all the fluid. So they're going to need to be rehydrated and metabolic alkalosis is going to be corrected. Why are they metabolic alkalosis? Again, they're losing all the hydrochloric acid that was in their stomach from the vomiting. They'll get parental fluids, replacement fluid therapy, usually delay surgery about 24 to 48 hours. The stomach is decompressed with an NG tube if the infant continues with vomiting. In infants with no evidence of fluid electrolyte balance, they're going to do the surgery right away. Feedings are usually begun four to six hours post-op, beginning with small, frequent feedings of water and electrolyte solution because you always want to correct the electrolyte imbalance. Preoperatively. The emphasis is on restoring the hydration and electrolyte, Im electrolyte imbalance. Just remember, guys, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, physiological integrity. Everything that falls under physiological integrity is what can kill your patient the fastest, and that's what needs to be corrected first. Fluid and electrolytes, nutrition, rest, vital signs, hemodynamic status, all of that good stuff, right? So. Um, restoring the electrolytes and hydrating the patient is absolutely a priority in any condition that can cause dehydration or can cause electrolyte imbalance, such as pyloric stenosis. The infants kept nothing by mouth and given IV fluids with glucose and electrolytes. Guess what? Glucose does fall under physiological integrity. What kills you faster, hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia? Hypoglycemia every single time. You're going to assess their vital signs, assess the skin and mucous membranes. Postoperatively, IV fluids are administered until the infant's taking and retaining adequate amounts of fluids by mouth. They'll get IV fluids, analgesics um, for pain because post-op, you're going to have pain. So we have to get, we have to address the pain. Feedings are usually instituted within 12 to 24 hours post-op, beginning with what? Clear liquids. If that patient vomits, we want to be able to look at that vomit and see if 
it um, has any bright red, see if there's any active bleeding going on. We're going to start with clear liquids. They're often in small quantities at frequent intervals, and that's your pylor stenosis. That is your pylor stenosis. Let's move on to interception. Interception. Interception is the most common cause of intestinal obstruction in children between three to six years of age. Pathophysiology. Before we even get to the patho, I want to show you this picture so you guys can have an idea of what's going on, okay? So guys, this is the GI tract, right? Look how it has telescoped into itself. It's telescoped into itself, and not only has it telescoped into itself, it's pulling those um, tissues and nerves and, and, and um, blood vessels with it. So basically, guys, it's suffocating the tissues because remember the tissues are fed, the tissues are perfused through the blood that's being carried in the vessels. Remember that blood that's what's carrying the oxygen, the vitamins, the nutrients, the minerals that the, those tissues need to survive. But when, but when it telescopes into itself, it's basically strangling off that supply. And that's what's happening in interception. So let's keep going. Interception occurs when the proximal segment of the bowel telescopes into a more distal segment. Look at this, pulling the mesentery with it. The mesentery is compressed and angled, resulting in lymphatic and venous obstruction. What did I write up here? Let me take a look. I wrote, um, this means the tissues are suffocating. Okay, so with this picture, they're showing you the blood vessels that are being drawn in. And so that lets you know, guys, and this is how you're supposed to think when you're studying. This is how you're supposed to think. You're supposed to say to yourself, okay, well, the blood vessels drawn in between layers. Why is that important to me? Okay, well, I know the blood vessels carry blood. I know the blood is important for perfusion. <gasps> Oh my gosh, this is going to cause the tissues not to not be perfused. It's causing a suffocation of the tissues. Down here, what did I write here? The bowel is telescoping within itself. So I just wrote an explanation of what's happening. All right, let's keep going. Venous engorgement also leads to leaking of blood and mucus in the intestinal lumen, and that's what causes that current jelly-like stool. Remember how I told you when you see or hear olive-shaped mass, you should be thinking of pyloristenosis? Well, guess what? When you see or hear jelly-like stool, you need to be thinking of interception. Signs and symptoms. Sudden acute abdominal pain. Well, this is different because when we were talking about pyloric stenosis, this was not painful for the, for the patient. In pyloric stenosis, the patient didn't even feel pain until they had surgery and the pain they felt was from the surgical site, right? But now that we're talking about interception, yes, they feel pain. And think about why they're feeling pain. Again, their bowel is telescoping within itself and pulling the mesentery with it. The child screaming and draws their knees to the chest. That is another important clinical manifestation. You see them drawing their knees to the chest. One of the first things you need to be thinking about is interception. Passage of ding, 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 red. That red is from the blood, guys. Red current jelly-like stools. By the way, that current uh, jelly-like, that's from that mucus. So that red and the red, the blood and mucus is what gives us that red current jelly-like stool. You see that? You should be thinking of what? Interception. Palpable sausage-shaped mass in the right upper quadrant. Sausage shape. That's interception. Diagnostic tests. Ultrasound. A rectal exam reveals mucus, blood, occasionally a low interception itself. But if you want to confirm that the patient's having interception versus something else, it's confirmed by ultrasound. Therapeutic management. They can get gas, uh, gas enema, hydrostatic enema. That's the hydrostatic enema, guys. That's the saline enema. IV fluids, NG decompression, antibiotics may be used before they give the hydrostatic reduction, uh, reduction. And if these procedures are not successful, then they're going to have to have surgery. But remember, we're always going to try to go from least invasive to most invasive. So we're going to try to see if that hydrostatic enema works first, right? Nursing care management. 
The description of the child's severe colicky abdominal pain combined with vomiting is a significant sign of interception. As soon as a possible diagnosis of interception is made, the nurse prepares the parent for the immediate need for hospitalization and the non-surgical technique. Remember that um, hydrostatic uh, enema? That's what's going to be tried first. But if it doesn't work, the patient's going to have to have surgery. The usual pre-op procedure, such as patient being NPO, uh, doing uh, routine laboratory testing, having the patient sign the consent, pre-anesthetic sedation, all of that's performed. Children with perforation. Remember, guys, I talked to you about perforation when I did that video on appendicitis. Perforation is a medical emergency, okay? Children with perforation will require IV fluid, systemic antibiotics, and bowel decompression before undergoing surgery. Why? We don't want that patient to turn septic. If you don't understand perforation, make sure you go back and watch my video on that because you have to understand that, all right? Fluid volume replacement. There we go. Fluid volume replacement uh, restoration of electrolytes may be required before surgery. Before surgery, the nurse monitors all stools. Look at this nursing alert. Notice it says before surgery, it's your responsibility to monitor the stools. With interception, we expect to see that red current jelly light stool. We don't want it to be that, but that's what we see in interception, right? Okay. Passage of, look at this guy's Normal brown stool usually indicates that the interception has reduced itself. So this patient has had interception. You're looking at the stools and then the patient has a BM and it's normal, normal brown. You got to let the a healthcare provider know right away because we're going to go ahead and do an ultrasound to confirm that it's reduced itself and the patient doesn't need surgery anymore. That is very important to know. That's been seen on NCLEX many times. Make sure you understand that. This is immediately reported to the practitioner who may choose to alter the diagnostic and therapeutic care plan. The minute you see that stool's normal brown, yeah, we're going to go ahead and do more tests to see what's going on. And hopefully that interception just reduced itself. After spontaneous or hydrostatic reduction, the nurse observes for passage of the water-soluble um, contrast media that was used, if it was used, and the stool patterns because the interception may occur, right? So you could have got brown stool. We confirm it by ultrasound. Everything's good, but you still got to be paying attention to the stool because maybe two BMs later, uh-oh, red current jelly-like again, which means it the patient has interception again. So it's very important, guys. Your nursing assessments need to be up to par. And guys, that's your interception. And it's very important. You guys have to know the differences of pyloric stenosis versus interception versus uh, appendicitis. You got to know uh, perforation. You have to know these disorders in peds. Guys, let me know what you thought about this video. Anything that you'd like to see me cover or cover more extensively. Don't forget, almost daily, I cover different topics on about nursing or nursing content on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And of course, you can find audio lessons on my um, website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Please, help support my channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe and maybe share this video on your social media platform or with a friend, colleague, coworker, or even a nursing instructor. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.